Hello and welcome to Microbiology. Today's lecture we are going to be talking about chapter one. Ah. And chapter one is going to be the main themes of microbiology, kind of like the why behind studying it. Like why do we care? It's not just to torture you guys, I promise, but it's actually to learn and be able to identify different microbes and how to um, eradicate them exactly, etc. I'm sorry. All right, so microbiology is the study of organisms that are too small to be seen without magnification. So micro, you guys know, means small. Macro is big. So macrobiology, for instance, would be trying to identify my baby Yoda, who's my head chef. Love baby Yoda. By the way, he was just helping me can. So anyway, that would be macro because you can see it with the naked eye. Where micro, microbiology, they're too small to be able to be seen through an actual um you know, your eyes, and so we have to use magnification through a microscope, etc. So microorganisms include bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, uh, elements, or worms, and algae. Um, where did microorganisms come from? Well, bacteria-like organisms have existed on Earth for a really long time, over or about 3.5 billion years, give or take a few million, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so obviously we can't exactly tell because we weren't, even though I'm old, we weren't there to actually see it. So we can um, guess through carbon dating, etc. But we have prokaryotes that, um, these are pro because they're pre-nucleus. So these are the really simple guys. These are not evolved or complicated at all. So those prokaryotes are the simple ones where eukaryotes have a true nucleus. We as humans are eukaryotic beings. And these would be the more complex cells. So you can see looking at the table here, we have the probable origin of Earth, again, 4.5 billion years ago. I know I'm old and showing my grade, but I wasn't there. So we can guess through carbon dating, et cetera. And then around Around four billion years ago, um, three and a half, four billion years ago, um, the prokaryotes are going to be appearing. And so those, again, are the very simplistic celled organisms. Well, then they evolved into the eukaryotic um, organisms, which have the organized nucleus and the organelles, etc. And then you can see going down the different pathways, the reptiles are going to appear, cockroaches, termites, etc. Then mammals, which would be um, like cats, dogs, etc. And then our humans appeared um, in the present time. So humans have only been around for a very short amount of time. Again, the point of this slide is prokaryotic cells have been around for a really long time, and eventually they evolved into the eukaryotic cells that make up our own body. So talking a little bit more about microbial structure, those prokaryotic cells, these are microscopic, because remember this is microbiology. So microscopic, unicellular, uni meaning one, cellular meaning cell, so it's one-celled organisms that lack nuclei as well as lack membrane-bound organelles. It's just a whole bunch of goo inside of a cell wall. Okay, well then we go to the more developed eukaryotic cells, and these again are going to be unicellular. Um, you again have to use a microscope to see them, and we can also evolve from unicellular to multicellular, like humans that have more than one cells. Um, they have a nucleus, and they also have membrane-bound organelles. And then viruses. Well, these are a class in and of itself. These are acellular. They're parasitic particles that are composed of nucleic acid and a protein, but they can't replicate on them their own. And so there's a debate on whether or not viruses are living or not, because since they can't replicate on their own, that's one of the definitions of what a living being is, right? So you can see, again, looking at the different pictures here, prokaryotic cells, they're very, very, very simple. Where eukaryotic cells, they have more organization and organelles and functions for each of those organelles. Then the viruses, they hijack a host cell, right? And so they're going to have a viral envelope, a capsid or capsule, and then the nucleic acid is in the inside. This is showing the AIDS virus, um, and you can see it kind of looks like a little um, plunger, and that's how it takes over and hijacks the, um, the cell for um, replication. So there are six different types of microbes, and these would be bacteria, fungi, algae, viruses, uh, the protococcal, uh, and then um, the hemoliths, right? So you can see that, and all of these are going to be bigger in your book, obviously, as well, but you can see that there are six different types, types of microbes. So um, 
looking at these, uh, these are going to be the different sizes, right? So we have, for instance, a locus where you can see these are macroscopic. You can see them with your eyes, right? And some of the little fungi. Where then microscopic, these are going to be, you have to use a microscope to see. So these would be like your amoebas, your coccus, your rods, your spirochetes, etc. Then you can go down to even smaller, smaller, and then the building blocks, which would be your amino acids and those hydrogen atoms, etc. So those would be your microbial dimensions from big macro to small micro. So how do we use this and why do we care? Well, the flow of energy and food through the Earth's ecosystems is very important. That's how you and I can stay alive and active, right? So we have photosynthesis and decomposition. So photosynthesis, this is important because this is where kind of where life comes from, honestly, because even if you're vegetarian, you're eating those green plants and stuff, but even if you're not vegetarian, I'm not, um, but you're eating cows, you know, pigs, etc., and those are eating the plants, right, that grew from photosynthetic um, processes. So photosynthesis is light-fueled conversion of carbon dioxide to organic material, okay? So it takes the carbon dioxide that we exhale and turns it back into um oxygen, right? We also have decomposition. Well, this is the breakdown of dead matter and waste into simple compounds. And so if you guys have ever walked in the woods and you see um, like leaves as they're degrading, right, you can see that they're just kind of wasting away to nothing. A dead animal, um, you know, that degrades and decomposes. And so decomposition is going to be the breakdown of those dead matters and partic particulates. So how do we use these microorganisms and why do we care? Well, there's a couple different subsets of technology. One is biotechnology. And you guys have probably already picked up that I'm really big on root words. Okay, so if we ever get stuck on a word, biotechnology you guys have all heard about, but if you ever get stuck on a word, break it down into the constituent words and that'll help you a lot. So bio meaning life, technology meaning, um, you know, the evolution technology, uh, the you know, workings of, et cetera. So using biotechnology, we can produce foods, drugs, and vaccines using living organisms. We're in the middle of COVID right now. As I'm recording this, it is August, the end of August, 2020. And so we're in the highlight of COVID. And so um, we're studying <laughs> vaccines to try to keep us safe, et cetera. Okay, but anyway, biotechnology is very, very important. And it uses microorganisms to study a lot. Genetic engineering, well, we can engineer or manipulate the genes of organisms to make new products. This can be good and this can be bad. And this would be a fun discussion to um, have in class. And actually, I'm going to write that down right now. So pros and cons of genetic and engineering. Because, you know, there's good things. For instance, um, you know, the, um, what is it? The, the crops and things that are genetically modified, GMOs, right? A lot of people are against them, and, you know, inherently I kind of am too, but they can be very good as well. So they are making some um, drought-resistant rice and bean species so that those in third world countries that don't have a lot of water and don't have a lot of things, they can actually grow their own food source and not have to do, rely on other people to drop off, you know, rice, beans, etc. And so in some situations like that, I think genetic engineering can be very helpful and it can, you know, help stimulate the economy and keep people alive and healthy. The bad part would be, you know, people can do evil things with science too. And so we can think of genetically engineering kids, and there are designer kids out there, you know, mostly in other countries, not in the United States, because it's ethically not really good. But, you know, you can design, I want a um, blonde-haired, blue-eyed kid. You know, I was blonde-haired, I had blue eyes when I was little. I want to have curly hair like me, but I don't want it to have these health problems. So you can use it to make what you want. So again, it can be good, but it can also be bad. And also with even genetic engineering with fruits. I mean, they're crossing, um, like there's cotton candy grapes, which by the way are amazing, 
but is that really necessary or are just people showing off? It doesn't really matter. We'll talk about that during class because it would be fun. And then also bioremediation. This is really big in the 21st century, right? We're really trying to um, leave the earth better than what we found it. And so we can use living organisms to remedy an environmental problem. So there, um, there's a whole bunch of articles out there and it's about how people are developing microbes to break down plastic so that we can um, you know, break down plastic in reuse it. Um, you know, we can use, you know, people do home composting piles, right? And you can buy microbes and different things to put inside of those um, compost piles to break down your, um, your compostable waste, etc. So we use microorganisms a lot. Well, what are the different lifestyles of these microorganisms? Microorganisms, the majority of them live in a free existence and they're relatively harmless and often beneficial. We can utilize them for our greater good. Okay, but some microorganisms, they have close associations with other organisms. For instance, parasites live on or in the body of another organism, and that's called the host. And most, some of the times it can damage the host. Sometimes we can have symbiotic relationships, but a lot of times they are damaging. And can we talked about a virus could be a type of parasite, right? Because it hijacks and takes that over. But parasites that live on or in the body um, can cause damage. So talking specifically about microbes and infectious diseases, pathogens, these are the microbes that do harm. We don't really like pathogens, and so that's what we get to study about in this microbiology class. So nearly 2,000 different microbes, they ca can cause diseases. There are 10 billion new infections a year worldwide and over 12 million deaths from infections year wide. Uh, worldwide. And again, it's 2020 right now. It's 827, 2020, if you guys are curious on what day it is when I'm recording this. And we're in the middle of a COVID uh, outbreak. So this class originally was supposed to be in person, and now it's online except for the lab portion, right? So we're in the middle of a pandemic, and um, we have a lot of deaths, unfortunately from some of this infectious disease. So anyway, back to this figure, um, the different percentages of infectious diseases per year. We have respiratory infections such as pneumonia and influenza that has about 26%. Um, you have AIDS causes about 18% of deaths. Diarrheal diseases such as cholera, dysentery, or typhoid are gonna cause about 17 and a half. TB, you guys have to get TB testing for nursing school and to be a nurse is about 11%, malaria is nine, measles seven, hepatitis five, tetanus, et cetera. And so, um, you know, it's, it's important that we study these things so that we understand what's going on. Here is uh, the top causes of death in the United States and worldwide. And so, for instance, in the United States, we have number one heart, uh, disease, the killing disease is heart disease, then cancer, stroke, um, uh, sorry, chronic lower respiratory disease, et cetera, et cetera, where worldwide we have heart disease, stroke, respiratory infection. So there's a couple that are different uh, rearrangement, but those that are highlighted, those are going to be the ones that are um, formed, uh, they're made from a microorganism. So again, this is why we're studying microbiology. So what are the historical foundations of microbiology? Well, thousands of microbiologists um, have been around and studying microbiology for over 300 years. Prominent discoveries include the microscope and using it for studies, so microscopy, the scientific method. The scientific method has been drilled into you since you guys were in elementary school, but we're going to talk about it a little bit more. And actually, you use it just about every day, even if you don't realize it, from looking at you know milk at the grocery store and finding one that has the farthest out expiration date. That's a, sci that's a method of scientific um, discovery, right, that we use and we don't even, like, we don't think, oh, I'm going to use a scientific method to figure out what, when, what milk to get, but it's the same thing where you're using logical processing to make the best outcome decision. And then also development of um, medical microbiology and microbiology techniques. So what is the scientific method? Well, it's a process by which observations of the natural world can be better understood through quantitative analysis. I'm going to point out this word quantitative. There's quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative, is, the root word is quantity. This is a measurable amount, quantity. I have 20 jars of pizza sauce next to me. I have, 
you know, 12 jars worth of pasta sauce next to me. That is a quantifiable hard number where if it's qualitative, this is more opinion based. Oh my gosh, I make the best barbecue sauces in the whole world, right? That's definitely opinion based. And so that would be qualitative where you can't really do hard statistics on it. So when we use the scientific method, we want to use those quantitative measures. It's a quantity that we can measure. It is a hard value. It's a range, whatever. And then we can do statistics on it and we can find the p-value for, um, you know, present that it was just a natural occurrence um, by chance or uh, if it's statistically significant, etc. So um, again, look for those root words and understand the reasoning behind those root words. So for instance, observation of a natural phenomenon, um, ask a question about the observation. There's two um, examples that people usually use. One is the milk in the grocery store and the other one is like saline or flashlight or whatever. And so, oh, my flashlight doesn't work. Well, what's the hypothesis? Oh, the light bulb could be burned out. Test the hypothesis. Well, let's change the light bulb. Did it support the hypothesis? Well, no, my light still doesn't work. So let's revisit and say, okay, well, let's put the old light bulb back in and check the batteries. Well, I think that the batteries of the flashlight were dead. Change those batteries. Oh, well, now the flashlight works. So yes, the batteries were bad in my flashlight. And we can conclude and say, you know, when Sally was camping, the flashlight um, batteries died and she, her flashlight was no longer able to be used. She changed the batteries and it fixed the problem. So that's using the scientific method for a very simple approach to um, figure out the problems. So like I said, we use it in an indirect way or direct way a lot of times throughout our normal day. And then, of course, whenever you're trying to do a, a good study and make a, an educated uh, decision. Um, so spontaneous generation, this is an early belief that some forms of life could arise from vital forces that are present in non-living or decomposing matter. For instance, flies from manure. And Louis Pasteur, he eventually disproved spontaneous generation and proved the theory of biogenesis. And this is the idea that living things can only arise from other living things. And so there's kind of like a couple cool um, studies, if you think like way back in the days when they were figuring this out of how they did it. You know, one was, um, you know, for the spontaneous regeneration, they had meat in two jars. One, they put a mesh over top so nothing could get in. And the other one they left open. And so if spontaneous generation was true, then the microbes, the meat that was in um, the jar should have, you know, spontaneously generated, uh, you know, microbes, but it didn't. So then you can just prove that, et cetera. The other fun one is one of the first murder cases, and um, they were trying to figure out who was guilty, and this person, unfortunately, was killed with a sickle, like a garden sickle, so like a, you know, a curved um, sword. And so they had all the um, farmers come and hold their sickles, and where the flies were attracted, <laughs> that was actually how they figured out who was guilty, because flies were attracted to the decomposition and the blood smells, et cetera, because the person didn't clean off the sickle very well. And so that was how you can use different theories in the scientific method to find bad guys, et cetera. But spontaneous generation was disproven, and we do have the theory of biogenesis. So let's talk about a couple of really important base scientists. Um, Loon Hook was a big one, okay, and he was a Dutch linen merchant, and he was the first to observe living micro microbes, and he made a single lens that magnified up to 300 times what your naked eye could see, and that's pretty cool back in the 1600s. I mean, I couldn't do that without buying a kit now, right, and so this guy was really, really smart. And so this was an example of his work where you have the lens here, the specimen holder, you can see it just can be held by a pin, the focus screw to change the depth of how far away it was from the lens, the handle, and then how he would hold it up to his eye. And this is some of the observations that he was able to see. You can see kind of some cocci, some rods, right, some spirochetes, different types of microorganisms that they were able to see for the first time. And so this is pretty cool. Moon Hook is um, a very well-established scientist that we talk about a lot. Um, and then we talked about spores and ster we discovered, sorry, spores and sterilization. Well, Tyndall and Kahn each demonstrated the presence of heat resistance, um, heat resistant forms to some microbes. So Kahn de determined that these forms um, to be heat resistant bacterial endospores. And so if they're heat resistant, he called them endospores. 
And then sterility is going to require the elimination of all forms, including endospores and viruses. So if you think about this, this is really important that we do, right? If I have to have surgery, I want my surgical instruments to be very sterile and I don't want little buggies hanging out on it to kill me, right? And so endospores are different um, than, you know, just the little guys that can be killed with bleach or something wiping off the table, right? These are heat-resistant bacteria. And back um, in the day when um, mad cow disease, what was it, mad cow disease? Yeah, what was first um, discovered, so this is what, in the mid-80s, 90s, 90s, um, they found that when they were autoclaving instruments, it wasn't killing off these um is uh, the, the the virus, right? Um, and so they actually had to figure out a way to like increase autoclaving temperature and a whole bunch of stuff. I'll find an article and we'll talk about it because it's really cool. Um, so anyway, but sterility is very important. They found that if they weren't sterile and they didn't wash their hands well, uh, then there was a lot of infections in surgeries, etc. So um, using the scientific method, they were able to investigate bacterial endospores. And so they had a hypothesis that bacterial endospores are the most resistant of all cells on Earth. So you can have endospores of certain bacteria or cells with endospores. And then they predicted that um, endospores can survive extreme conditions such as temperature radiation, lack of water, and chemicals. And then they treated them. They have survival of endospores before um, or survival of non-endospores. Right, and they were able to do different tests, and they were able to hypothesize and prove that endospores are the only cells that can are consistently capable of surviving a wide range of deconstructive environment conditions. In order to sterilize, these cells must be eliminated. So obviously, take them out and not pass them on to your next person. Right. So this led to the development of aseptic techniques. Aseptic sterility, you guys are very familiar with this, and especially with COVID right now, we have COVID hand uh, washing breaks on the radio, right? So we wash our hands and we have to, you know, wash them all the good way and everything like that. So this, um, these findings were um, developed into the techniques of aseptic um, sterilization. So the human body is a source of infection, okay? So if I get a bad paper cut and I don't keep stuff outside, it can, outside of the wound, it can cause a lot of problems, et cetera. So there are a couple different people that were really instrumental in making um, these theories and hypotheses proven. So Holmes observed that mothers of home births had fewer infections than those who gave births in hospitals. Nowadays, most uh, births are in the hospital, but back in the day, um, they had a lot of home births, right? Well, if you have more infections in the hospital, that's kind of a problem. So we really needed to develop those aseptic techniques. Samuel Lewis, um, he correlated that infections with physicians coming directly from the autopsy room to the mater maternity room is what caused these. So these doctors were working on some dead people and trying to figure out what's going on and what killed them. And then without properly sterilizing, changing clothes, washing hands, etc., they were taking those um, microbes to healthy moms, right? And then obviously that wasn't a very good idea. Well, then Lister, he's the one that introduced aseptic techniques, and these were specifically to reduce microbes in the medical settings and to prevent wound infections. As I was getting ready to record this, it was kind of funny because I was like, ooh, Lister, I wonder if that's why Listerine. Highly doubt it, but that's how my mind works, and I got a little chuckle about it. Okay, so anyway, Lister, he involved disinfection of hands using chemicals prior to surgery, and then also the use of heat for sterilization. Uh, sterilization. So obviously very good because we don't want to go to the hospital and get infections. So he postulated the gene germ theory of disease. So many diseases are caused by the growth of microbes in the body and not by sins, bad character, poverty, etc. Unfortunately, these used to be um, very well accepted techniques, or, or not techniques, but really um, theories, right? And so they'd be like, oh, Janet, you only got, you you got sick because you were thinking in pure thoughts, so we need to, you know, rebaptize you and get you pure again. Or, oh, you looked at your neighbor really kind of in a, not a good way because you're married, Janet, so that's a sin, and therefore we're going to give you botulism. Okay, Obviously, we know the reasons behind these things now. It's not anything to do with your habits, sins, bad character, or just because you're poor, right? It's because of microbes. And so two major contributors to this germ theory of disease were Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch. 
Okay. So who is Pasteur? Well, he was, he's actually not that old, right? Just over a hundred and I don't know, 30 years old. That's not too bad, right? So anyway, uh, he showed that microbes cause fermentation and spoilage, and he disproved the spontaneous regeneration of microorganisms, and I think he was the one that did the meat experiment in the different jars. He also developed pasteurization. Oh, he had a cool thing. We don't have a picture of it, but um, it's, uh, you know, where it was a couple different, it was a closed system with water in between that, you know, didn't allow microbes to travel or an open system where microbes could uh, travel. I'll see if I can find the video for it. Hold on a second. Anyway, I'll find it and I'll post it. Anyway, he was able to disprove the spontaneous generation of microorganisms, and he developed the idea of pasteurization. So uh, pasteurization, we pasture. So I wonder if I invent something, it could be millerization. I don't know. All right, and this was demonstrated uh, what is now known as the germ theory of disease. So pasture was instrumental in a lot of things. Okay. So, and then Robert Koch, well, he established Koch's postulates, and this is a sequence of ex experimental steps that verified germ theory. And this identified the causes of anthrax, tuberculosis, and cholera. And he was also able to develop pure culture methods so that we could study each organism. So we get to actually play with this in, uh, in lab and, you know, learn from his findings. Um, so wrapping up this chapter, then, let's talk a little bit about taxonomy. Taxonomy is the organization, the classification, and the naming of living things. And this is the formal system that was originated by Carl von Linn. Okay? And this is concerned with classification, which is an orderly arrangement of organisms into groups, nomenclature, fancy word for giving things names, right? And then identification, so we can determine and record the traits of organisms for placement into the different taxonomic structures and schemes. So um, the levels of classification would be the largest is the domain, which is archaea, bacterial, and eukarya, the kingdom, then the phylum or division, the class, the order, the family, and then the genus and species. So a lot of times when we refer to a specific thing, we just refer to it as a genus species. For instance, we are Homo sapiens, right? Homo erectus sapiens. So our genus is Homo, and the species is sapiens. Um, Canis familiaris, that would be the like family dog, right? And so anyway, the levels of classification goes from the biggest down to the smallest. So here would be your picture of domains all the way down to the genus and species. Um, so how do we assign these different scientific and specific names? Well, it's using the binomial scientific nomenclature um, spread. And it gives us each micro microbe two names, that, that genus, which is going to be capitalized, and the species, which is going to be lowercase. And they're both going to be in italics or underlined to determine that they're the genus species. Okay, So Staphylococcus aureus, a lot of times we will... Um, it will truncate it into S. aureus or Staph aureus, but the full name is Staphylococcus aureus. And then uh, inspiration for names is extremely varied and often very imaginative. And so I think it'd be fun if you guys find the most ridiculous named things. It's uh, There's some that are named after Star Wars, Star Trek, and a whole bunch of different names, so they're fun. All right, uh, phylogeny, this is the natural relatedness between groups and organisms. And then um, evolution, okay? we You guys know a lot about evolution by now, right? And so this is going to be where all new species are going to originate from pre-existing species. And they're closely related organisms. They have set similar features because they evolved from common ancestral forms. And then evolution is usually uh, progresses towards a greater complexity. So here would be a picture of three domains of life. Okay? You have the uh, bacteria, which are your true bacteria. You have your archaea, and these are odd bacteria that live in extreme environments such as high salt, like salt lakes in Salt Lake, Utah, right? Heat, the hot springs um, at Old Faithful, and then, um, other ones. And then eukarya, these have nucleuses and organelles, or mini organs. Right. And then the final picture is going to be the evolutionary relationships between, between Earth's inhabitants. So you have your domain bacteria, 
you have your dark domain, domain archaea, and then you have your kingdoms, um, and then all these go down to converge into one single ancestral cell line, which would be those first living cells that occurred with evolution. All right, so that wraps up this module, and we'll see you all next time.